Hi, how are you? Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Today we'll be looking at the 2017 Annual Information Statement, what it contains, what it asks, and how your charity can go about filling it in. My name's Chris Richards. I'm part of the ACNC's education team. Joining me from the ACNC Advice Services team is Heath Eldridge. Hi, Heath. Hi, everyone. Before we get started, as is usually the case, some quick housekeeping notes and bits and pieces. First, if you have troubles with the audio for the webinar, you can try listening through your phone. You can call the number listed in the email you will have received upon sign up and put in an access code and listen to the webinar that way. If you want to ask any questions during the webinar, you can do so at any time by using the tools in the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. We've got our colleagues Michael and Simone uh, on hand. They're ready to answer any questions as they come through. We'll try to respond to every question that comes in, but we may not get to all of them. If you do ask a question and it isn't answered, we do keep a record of, uh, of all the questions asked and we'll try to respond by email uh, after the webinar. Um, Alternatively, if your question isn't answered or you come up with something after everything's done and dusted, uh, feel free to drop us a line and we'll get back in touch with you. We're recording the webinar today and we'll publish the recording, including a copy of the transcript and the presentation slides, on the ACNC website in the coming days. So if you need to take off early or if you miss something, you can always come back and watch it later on. Also, you don't need to madly write down all the website references that we mentioned through the webinar today, as we'll include those in the follow-up email that we'll send as well. Finally, we really value your feedback, as is always the case. If you have any suggestions for ways we can improve our webinars, please let us know in the short survey that you'll receive at the end of this webinar, or drop us a line via email. Okay, now that's all the admin stuff out of the way. Let's get rolling. Today's webinar aims to help charities filling out their annual information statement for the first time, or those who have completed it in previous years. Obviously, most of you joining us today will have, will have a reporting period which aligns with the calendar year, and who and who are set to work on their annual information statements in the lead up to the June 30 deadline. We'll provide a quick bit of information, there we go, on what the annual information statement is, as well as highlight our annual information statement hub and the expanded support materials available to those completing their form. We'll also run through the other material you should have on hand to help. This webinar will cover the entire form, but there, are, there will be a specific focus on some of the new or revised parts of the 2017 AIS, as well as parts of the financial section and questions in the activity section. We'll also offer a reminder of what happens if your charity doesn't get its AIS done. You can probably guess that that news isn't so positive. So onwards, next slide. That highlights the support and the resources available to charities completing their AIS. First up is the AIS hub. The hub is the place to go which links charities with the annual information statement form, as well as to guidance and information they'll need to complete their 2017 statement. The hub links to our redesigned 2017 AIS guide, which is far easier to use than previous years. Our AIS checklist and avoiding mistakes document contains important information and reference materials to help you complete the statement, as well as providing tips on avoiding common mistakes made by charities in past years. Now, there's also a dozen short how-to videos scattered throughout the AIS guide. They feature my best speaking voice, and help guide charities through sections and specific questions of the annual information statement in detail. We've also made big improvements to help text throughout the annual information statement form. Clicking on the purple help buttons throughout the AIS form will provide further advice as well as direct links back to relevant spots in the guide or to other pages on the ACNC website. Okay, for those unfamiliar with the annual information statement, Chris, what is it? Glad you asked, Heath. It's an online form, which you've probably guessed, and it's one that all charities must complete each year or each reporting period, unless they have an exception. And that's something that we'll just cover a little bit more uh, in detail later on. The form asks a series of financial and non-financial questions. Financial questions look at things like charity revenue, expenses, funding sources, and the like. Non-financial questions cover a number of other aspects of charity work, uh, as you can see here on the slide. Um, activities, that's you know who charities help, staff and volunteer numbers, uh, elements of reporting, board and committee members, 
who, uh, and we call them responsible persons, uh, that sort of thing. Now, we use the info we get in a, in a variety of ways. Uh, obviously, firstly, it informs the ACNC's work to ensure charities are complying with their obligations and, and doing the right thing. This in turn ensures public trust and confidence in the sector and the charities uh, which comprise it is, uh, is high and remains high. Uh, it's also used to compile studies like our annual Australian Charities Report uh, to help streamline reporting to different state, territory and federal regulators so that we can cut duplicate reporting and red tape, uh, and that's in line with one of the objects of the ACNC Act. We also publish some of the info gained on each charity's listing in the ACNC Charity Register. Now, you can have a look at your organisation's charity register listing by going to acnc.gov.au forward slash charity register. The annual information statement's due dates vary, but the form must be submitted within six months of the end of the charity's reporting period. The two most common deadlines are June 30 and December 31, the former being the one applicable to most people today. You can check your charity's annual information statement deadline by visiting its entry on the charity register. Uh, and a full rundown of uh, AIS due dates can be found on the ACNC website at acnc.gov.au forward slash reporting due dates. Accessing the AIS form itself can be done in one of two ways. The first way is to go through the ACNC charity portal by clicking on the purple portal tab in the top right of the ACNC homepage. From there, you can log into the portal by using your charity's username and password. Remembering that the username is the ABN. Navigate to the 2017 form from the menu which appears on the left hand side of your screen. The second way is to click the purple submit the AIS button on the ACNC homepage. You can see it highlighted on the, side, on the slide of your screen. This will take you directly to the 2017 Annual Information Statement Hub. The first option in the Hub menu is Submit the 2017 AIS. Click on it, log into the charity portal when prompted, if you haven't already logged in, and you'll be taken directly to the introductory page of the Annual Information Statement form. The AIS form's introductory page will list the material you should have handy to help you complete your charity statement. We've also compiled a list on this slide. Again, don't feel the need to jot all these links down. We'll get the slides and a recording of this webinar up onto our website in the coming day or two, so you'll be able to browse the links at your leisure. Charities also have the ability to save their form as they go. Now, we recommend that you, you do so frequently when completing your form. And if you save and exit the form, you can pick up where you left off when you return. Charities can also preview their annual information statement before they submit it. This means that they can check over responses before submission or maybe even consult with other responsible persons or office bearers in their organisations just to make sure what is being submitted is as accurate as it can be. Now, final point before we get to the form. The ACNC is asking charities who are completing their AIS to be patient when working through the form. There are times where the form will need to refresh and perhaps load new questions depending on your responses. When this happens, a clear loading message will appear on the screen. Also, your web browser, uh, uh, sorry, your web browser will display when it is refreshing or loading. Be patient and wait for these processes to finish before continuing with the form. And again, save your progress often. We do apologise if the form is a little slow loading. We're well aware that high numbers of people accessing the form can slow it down. On a positive and more exciting note, upgrades to the ACNC website, the ACNC's forms, including the AIS form and other forms, and the charity portal are well in train. These upgrades aren't just a quick grease and oil change either. These are significant improvements that will really enhance the user's experience and make it far easier for visitors to our website to get to where they need to go and to complete tasks like completing or filling in their AIS. We are genuinely excited with what's being planned and what's being worked on. The new systems and upgrades will see the ACNC website far quicker, far more responsive and far more attractive. And as for forms like the AIS, they will be very responsible, as, uh, very responsible, goodness me, very responsive as well and far more intuitive to use. We are currently working through the design questions and content for the 2018 AIS and the form is undergoing major and exciting improvements. 
We'd suggest that anyone interested in updates on the improvement either keep their eye on the ACNC website or sign up to receive ACNC updates and the Commissioner's columns. This can be done via the ACNC homepage. Just on that, Chris, one of the things that we're suggesting that charities do while we move towards upgrading our website is to be particularly sure to keep their address for service up to date. That way we can let them know about any changes that are happening that might affect them. And that's the easiest way that uh, we'll be able to contact people to alert them to updates and alert them to changes, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now into the form. Hey. After all that, onto the form. The first thing to note, compulsory questions are marked with a red asterisk so they're easy to see. You won't be able to progress to the next page of the annual information statement form until you have answered the mandatory questions on your current page. Section A. That's pretty basic. We ask a few quick questions about basic charity information, charity name, contact points, details, etc. You'll notice as you start on this section, some of the questions have information already entered in. This pre-filling draws on information provided in previous AIS submissions. However, if the pre-filled information is incorrect or out of date, you can, of course, change it. Ensure you enter your address for service correctly in question four, which we just mentioned. <laughs> Here we go. Your address for service is the address, often an email address, which you wish the ACNC to use to send all correspondence to your charity. This is a vital detail and something which the ACNC really wants all charities to check, double check and triple check. Mm -hmm. Make sure you've addressed, entered the right address for service, as we say, it's very important. Yes. This section also asks you to state the size of your charity, small, medium, or large. It is important that you respond correctly as your response to this question will shape the questions you will be asked later in the AIS and will affect the amount of information you'll need to supply to us through the process. On to section B, activities. Now, section B poses questions about your charity's work. You'll be asked if your charity uh, has actually carried out any activities during the previous reporting period. Activities, as we define them or describe them, can be financial or non-financial. Now, the ACNC recognises that activities are more than just tangible on-ground work. There are other things that amount to charity activities as well. Things like strategic planning, uh, undertaking admin work, uh, even just employing staff. These are all activities. The aim of asking about whether your charity conducted activities is to help us identify inactive charities. Now, for all of you with us today, it's highly unlikely your charity will be inactive. So answering yes to this question is most likely the way to go. Now, if you do answer no, you will be asked to explain why your charity didn't conduct activities in the 2017 reporting period. Other questions in this section focus on your activities and beneficiaries. Question 9, which you can see here, asks charities about their activities during the 2017 reporting period. You'll be asked to choose your charity's main activity from a drop-down list. This question is mandatory, and as always, there's help in the IAS guide. But in answering this question, you should, from the drop-down menu, choose the category that best describes your charity's main activity. Many charities have multiple main activities, which is where the next part of the question comes in. If your charity does have more than one main activity, you can select from the list below. What you're seeing on the screen right now is the first part of the question with the first drop down menu. This is what it looks like in the form. The next questions in this section will ask you where your charity conducted its activities, the locations both within Australia and overseas in which you did your work. You will also be asked to describe how your charity activities and outcomes helped achieve its purpose. While there is a decent sized text field here in which charities can respond, the ACNC pro strongly recommends keeping your response to this question to a short summary in the form of two to three dot points or a couple of short sentences. The summary might include a link to your organisation's website homepage or about us page as well. In fact, we welcome this type of link if it helps keep your summary short. That's question 10, which you can see on your screen at the moment. Now, question 11, which is, as logic would dictate, just below question 10, asks you to state who your charity's beneficiaries are, which general or specific section of the community your charity's activities and programs helped. When thinking about their beneficiaries, many charities will note that they help a wide cross-section of the community. If that's the case, or if your charity is focused on the environment or on animal welfare, select general community in Australia as your response. 
Okay, so that's section B done. I'm going to section C. This is a shorter section and it focuses on your charity's human resources. That's its staff and its volunteers. The section is pretty self-explanatory. It asks you to fill in the number of employees, both full and part-time, and also the number of volunteers. Your annual report, your organisational chart, or your pay-as-you-go payment summaries, uh, all three of these things can help you answer these questions. It's important to remember here though that volunteers can be regular, they can be helping out every day or week or, or month, or even irregular, semi-regular, or one-off. Volunteers can also include any unpaid board or committee members too. Uh, we, ask, uh, we ask in this section as well about how many full-time equivalent or FTE staff worked for your charity during the last pay period of the 2017 reporting period. This figure is the number of full-time employees that your charity would have if it combined the hours of full-time, part-time and casual employees. Now, it's important that you do not include volunteer numbers in your FTE staff figure. Some charities have been doing this. The FTE figure does not include volunteers, just staff. Now, the 2017 AIS guide, that has some pretty useful guidance to help you answer this FTE question. Uh, it also has an example which sets out how to calculate the figure in some detail. In addition, the ACNC's FTE calculator can help you work out this figure accurately. Links to the calculator are available in the AIS guide and directly from the annual information statement form via the uh, help text or the help links. Last thing, the ACNC will accept your best estimate when it comes to these figures, just in case you're not 100% sure of exact numbers. So if you can work out the exact figures, that's great. If not, provide your best estimate. On to section D, in finances. This is usually the section of the AIS where people can make mistakes or get a touch lost. It is a bit involved. Again, reading our avoiding mistakes document at the link on the screen mm. can help charities guard against commonly made errors. Ways to prevent some of the more commonly made errors in this section are listed on the slide you can see on your screen. A lot of it is about being well prepared and having all the information you need on hand before starting this section. Another important step is to double check your figures to make sure there aren't any typos or mistakes. A number of the errors in this section are simple typos, so a quick double check is important. Those charities that are identified as having made mistakes in their annual information statements have to, had to look over their form again, find and correct the errors and resubmit it. A bit annoying and quite time consuming. So we stress here how important it is for you to check, double check and triple check the information and figures you provide in this section. That's a lot of checking. All right. Just a reminder also that the questions in this section are mandatory except for non-government non schools and confirmed basic religious charities. Also, as in previous years, the questions which appear in section D will vary depending on the size of your charity, be it small, medium or large. This is because reporting requirements vary depending on charity size. So answer the charity size question asked in section A correctly so that, it, so that you don't over or under report. You can see the cutoff points uh, which define small, medium and large charities up here on, on this slide right now. The ACNC bases charity size on annual revenue. You can see this, you can see on this slide a quick definition of revenue. It's important your charity knows the difference between revenue and income here so it gets things right. Revenue is usually shown as one of the top line items in the income, profit and loss statement. It can be made up of grants, donations or bequests, sales of goods, interest or fees for service provision. As we've already said, different sized charities have different reporting requirements. And we've got the requirements for medium and large charities financial reporting here on the screen at the moment. One thing that medium and large charities need to do, which small charities don't have to, is to submit an annual financial report alongside their annual information statement. Submitting an annual financial report is mandatory for medium and large charities, but it's optional for small ones. What the annual financial report has to include is listed, again, up on your screen. These requirements are for charities with no transitional reporting requirements. Also note that medium-sized charities have the option of submitting a reviewer's report or an auditor's report, while large charities, they have to submit an auditor's report. The annual information statement form will request that you upload your financial report as an attachment. When you get to this point, just choose your file, 
click the attach button. Now your file might be on your computer desktop, for example, uh, or in your documents folder. Uh, yeah, click the attach button and um, make sure that you actually do click the attach button. We've had a couple of charities uh, not do so. Uh, that means that their financial report hasn't attached, has been missing, and when they've submitted their annual information statement, uh, it hasn't accompanied it and we've had to get back in touch with them. Um, so make sure you hit the attach button, make sure that the document uploads and attaches. We'd suggest saving your form at this point too, and you should probably, as we've mentioned before, be saving the form regularly. Again, a reminder of the guidance and reference material we have that specifically relates to charity financial reporting. Also, a quick point of emphasis that the ACNC does check information submitted by charities in the AIS. This includes the financial information. It's very important that the information registered charities submit is accurate, correct and error free, particularly as this information is made available to the public on the ACNC charity register. And again, just um, before you go jotting away, we'll, uh, we'll get these slides out to you all uh, in the coming uh, day or two. They'll be available up on our site. So um, you'll be able to, uh, at your leisure, take note of uh, all these uh, links and web addresses so that you can refer to the right information around the place. Section E and Section G. We'll start with Section E, and it's uh, it's new to the AIS uh, in 2017, or the 2017 AIS, sorry. Section E sees charities able to upload their annual report or share a web link to it so that it can be displayed as part of their entry on the ACNC charity register. Having your annual report on the register is a great way for charities to showcase the work they do to existing and potential donors, supporters, funders, and to the general public. It increases charity transparency as well. And as a part of the upgrades and improvements to our systems, which we discussed earlier, the charity register is being improved as a key way to communicate charities' work and messages to the wider public. Having a great entry on the charity register will become increasingly important. So if you want to upload a copy of your annual report, just choose the file when you're prompted, find the document you wish to attach, again, on your desktop, in your documents folder, uh, wherever it might be, and hit the attach button, which will appear on your screen. Remember to wait to ensure that the document uploads and attaches. If your annual report is already online, it might be already up on your website, perhaps, your charity can just type in the website address which links to the document. Now, while we're here, we'll have a quick look at section G as well. This section contains questions about certain details the ACNC holds, just to make sure they're up to date and they're accurate. This year, charities have the ability to update their responsible persons directly through their annual information statement. If your responsible persons have changed positions within the organisation, if they've left, or if you've got new responsible persons, all these changes can be easily outlined through the AIS. The image that you see up on the screen there, it, that comes from this section of the form and shows the list of your charity's responsible persons. At the moment, that one there is empty, of course. If any responsible persons have left your charity, they've changed roles, you can edit or remove their details by clicking on the Remove Edit option in the first table. To add a responsible person, go to the second table and click on the Add New Record option. Then add your new record in the little pop-up which appears and save. Section G also prompts charities to update their governing document or their charity subtypes through the ACNC charity portal. Again, updating this information ensures the info that we have about your charity is accurate and it's up to date and ensures that your charity complies with its obligation to notify the ACNC of any changes to any details. Now that we've covered sections E and G, we'll go to the questions right in the middle of them, section F. Mm. Questions in section F aim to help the ACNC work with state and territory regulators to implement streamlined reporting. One of the objects under the ACNC Act is to promote the reduction of unnecessary regulatory obligations on the Australian not-for-profit sector. The ACNC continues to work with the states and territories to find ways to cut duplicate reporting. We've made significant progress as well, particularly over the last 12 to 18 months, with further progress likely to be made in time for the 2018 AIS process. Stay tuned and watch this space. <laughs> so, Section F for the 2017 AIS. There's two main questions. The first question refers only to charities incorporated with this state or territory and which report to a state or territory regulator. This might be the Office of Fair Trading or a consumer protection body. 
If your charity is incorporated in a state or territory of Australia, answer yes. Otherwise, select no. If you answer yes, the form will refresh, so let it refresh, and you'll be asked a little bit more, or for a little bit more info. The state or territory you're incorporated in, as well as your incorporated association number. Then, depending on what state or territory you are incorporated with, you might be asked questions about your charity's annual general meeting date, and perhaps some other membership related details. The second question in this section is related to fundraising. Charities will be asked if they intend to fundraise during the 2018 reporting period. If you answer yes, you'll be asked which states or territories you'll be fundraising in. If you hold a fundraising license, enter it next to the relevant states or territories. Again, save your progress and continue. Technically section AF, is the next part of the 2017 Annual Information Statement. But this section deals with ancillary funds and is not applicable for the vast majority of charities completing the AIS. If, however, you do need to fill in this section, our AIS guide contains extensive support to help you out. Completing this section of the AIS replaces the requirement to launch a separate Australian Taxation Office ancillary fund return for 2017. Important also to note that any information a charity provides for this section will not be published, but will only be forwarded to the ATO. Yeah, indeed. Section eight, that's the final section of the annual information statement, and it contains the declaration. That asks charities for confirmation that all the information they've provided is correct. Now, remember to select the responsible person's declaration tick box. There you go, that's an interesting one. That appears on the last page. Selecting or ticking this box shows you've acknowledged that you've read and that you've understood the form. Some people have been forgetting to select the tick box, and if you don't, the form cannot be submitted. Again, before signing off, we recommend you double check your form. A great way to do so is to view and print out a preview. To do so, click on the preview submit submission button near the bottom of the declaration page. It's in blue, it's, there's a copy of it there on screen. You'll be able to view and print a copy of your form uh, and you or your responsible persons can check it over, review it, revise things if necessary. We should note here it's important that you don't forget to actually submit your annual information statement once you've completed and reviewed it. Just don't forget to do this. We've had a number of charities that in past years have gone to all, their, all the hard work, they've completed their form, but then they've not submitted it. And they haven't realised until the ACNC has alerted them that their statement was still outstanding. And it's far easier to do than, than, than what you might think too. So click on the big green submit button at the bottom of the screen. Again, there's a copy of it there. Then wait for confirmation that your form has actually been submitted. And that's it. Once you've done that, your AIS is done. Now that we've gone through how charities can submit their 2017 Annual Information Statement, we need to quickly touch on things that might happen if they don't. This slide provides a rundown of the consequences of not submitting an Annual Information Statement. Of course, we'd rather not have to mention these things, but we do still have charities that don't do the right thing and fulfil their reporting requirements. There are many actions the ACNC can take if charities don't do the right thing. They range from statements and red marks on the organisation's charity register listing, things which make it clear to the public that the charity isn't up to date with its reporting, to penalty notices and the possibility of your charity losing its registration. If your charity doesn't submit an annual information statement for two years, it becomes what we term a double defaulter and, will, and we will look to revoke its registration, which means it loses its eligibility for tax concessions and the like. There's more on what happens if you don't submit your annual information statement at acnc.gov.au slash fail to submit AIS. Goodness me, here's a long list of links, it is a long list of links, to a great long list of pages on the ACNC site, which we've mentioned throughout the webinar today, or which have been featured at the bottom of some of our slides. Again, don't stress if you don't get all these jotted down, we'll get this info to you in the coming days uh, via email, and this presentation will be available on our website very soon. And we have a look here. This is all the ways, or these are all the ways you can keep in touch with us. Uh, our site, contact details, and various other things we do. Please stay in touch with the ACNC via the Commissioner's column and email updates. We've got plenty of webinars like this as well. Uh, past ones that you can view, future ones that you can register for. Uh, we're pretty active on social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, 
Uh, and we've got a range of podcasts for different chats about different topics that are of importance to charities and the charity sector more broadly. Now, normally at this point, we'd respond to a couple of questions and thanks for continuing to send them through to us. Uh, Michael and Simone are busily responding to them there in the background. But today we thought it would be a good opportunity very quickly to emphasise three or four key points our advice services team, including Heath here, are keen to emphasise for those charities and people who are completing the 2017 AIS. Our advice services staff are often the great people on the other end of the phone who help those ringing us up with queries and are often the first contact point for those with questions about the AIS. So we've got four quick points. We've probably mentioned a couple of them throughout uh, the webinar today, but we're just going to go back over them, emphasise them again, and make sure that the uh, the message is loud and clear. What is the first point we wish to emphasise? Hey? Look, the first point we wish to emphasise is that charities should submit it on time, Chris. Extensions to the due date are only given in rare and extenuating circumstances which are beyond the control of the charity. As a general rule, it's best to assume that it simply needs to be done on time. Yeah. Hanging off that also, we did mention during this that there's some upgrades coming up to our IT facilities. Indeed. But we would recommend that you don't do it at the last minute. <laughs> we do yes. find that the system gets overly busy, yep. particularly on peak due dates, such as the 30th of June, mm. and that can cause a problem for charities trying to submit. The best way to avoid that problem is just to get in and do it a little bit earlier than 5 o'clock on the last day. Indeed. So gather the information that you need, get it all together and plan some time a few weeks before the actual due date would be a good way to go about things, I suppose. And I suppose the other thing there is that if you don't find that you don't have everything you need, you can save it and come back to it. Yes, yes. Second one, uh, and we mentioned this a couple of times, uh, we had a bit of a chuckle about it, but again, press submit. Please press submit at the end of your uh, AIS adventure. It, that, that sounds flippant, Chris, but you'd be surprised how many calls we get which, for example, a charity's just received a reminder and they say, oh, but, but we did that last November. And the advice services staff member goes in there and has a look at their form, which is something we can do. Mm. And they say, oh, well, you've done everything except for hit the submit button. Yeah. We've all taken many of those calls. Yeah. What happens if that, ha if that happens from our end, from an advice services end? What happens if someone rings, oh, yeah, it's all good, but now I've got a notice saying that I haven't submitted? What does a charity then need to do? Well, they need to hit submit. Yeah. They do have to do it themselves. We can't do it for them under the Act. We yes. require them to have made that submission because they're making a declaration that the information in there is true. Yep, yep. Um, so it's it, important in that way for charities to realise that the person at the other end of the phone from the ACNC can't hit the button for them. No, they can't. No. Third point. Ensure that all mandatory fields in the form are completed. Now, again, this is something that trips people up. Um, now, it's not to say that these might be the only fields or only answers that you should be providing, but if you don't complete the mandatory fields, you won't be able to submit your form. Now, the mandatory fields can be identified relatively simply. They're the ones with the little red asterisks uh, next to them in the form. So as you go through, just keep an eye on where the red asterisks are. Make sure that you're filling those ones in as well as all the other ones you need to. And again, go back and check <coughs> and, and, and double check where you need to. Lastly, and we did mention this during the, the webinar already, take the time to check your address for service and your responsible persons. Now is the time to update these items or at least check them. Now, why is this? We, we do keep saying this and keep emphasising this. Why is a address for service important, particularly as we go towards upgrading the site and, and that sort of stuff? Well, the address for service is always important. Yeah. That's the primary address by which the ACNC will contact a charity. However, it's particularly important at the moment because we are updating the site, we will need to contact charities. Uh, it's going to impact on how they log into the portal and some, some other changes. Yes. So we will need to contact them and having a correct address for service allows us to do that quickly and efficiently. Yeah. And updating responsible persons, that's just uh, that's just part of the obligations that charities have to update information that changes, isn't it? Well, firstly, it's an obligation. They do have under the ACNC Act to let us know. But from a practical point of view, it's important because their donors and customers may check on the charity portal to see who the charity registered to see who the responsible persons are yeah 
It's also important for us because the responsible persons ring us up. And in order to pass proof of identity, being listed on the file helps very much. Yes, yes. Um, just one other thing there, Chris. On that cool. stay in touch screen that you've got there in front of you, yep. it says that we take phone calls from 9 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Hold on. Here we go. We're good. We haven't changed the slide. This isn't good. <laughs> We've actually had a change in our operating hours, and we're yep. now open from 9 until 5, Australian yep. Eastern Time. Yep. Uh, phone number, obviously, still the same yes. as well. Uh, and email address, still, the, still same the same as well. Beautiful. Thank you for picking that up. I'm going to have to go and revise that. That's not good. All righty. Look, on that note, we're going to say farewell for now, um, and we're going to let you get back to what you're doing or in some parts of Australia, go and have a bite to eat. Thank you very much for joining us, everyone. Thank you to Michael and to Simone for answering all the questions madly in the background. Uh, and a extra big thanks to Heath for co-piloting today. Thanks, Chris. We really appreciate everyone's attendance uh, and we look forward to you uh, joining us for another webinar in the future. Go have a look uh, on the website, uh, acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars. That will give you a rundown of past ones as well as future ones that you can register for. But for now, have a great day. See you later.